can you? All right. Take me a couple of minutes to get some junk here. check and see if the audio is right there uh, USB looks like it's picking me up okay good so ready to go here Chats have come in, let's see. Audio check is good, good, thank you. Okay, good, glad it's working. So uh, let me just put up the schedule. I have changed something in the schedule, so it's appropriate to remind people. Um, here we go, 123, all right. What I did was I was updating the cryptography lecture and I decided I'm just gonna break it in half. So we'll have part of it this time and part of it next time and there's still enough classes to cover everything. That gives us an extra class at the end, which I'll just do an open lab. I'll help anybody who wants to work on projects. I've also decided uh, to make the final online. Uh, I'll limit the time somewhat, and I'm going to try and write questions where you can't just look up the answer, but it'll be open book and online. Um, something I've resisted in the past, but I'm going to give it a try this semester, like the quizzes. It will probably be harder than the quizzes, though, because it's not... Uh, it's intended to be more of a measure of success. However, most students in my classes never take finals anyway. That's why I realized, because the scores are here. At this time in the semester, there's always a lot of people worried about their grade. The grading system is here, and if you do all the extra credit, it's pretty easy to get enough points to get an A without taking the final. And uh, these people in highlighted in green have already done that. So, uh, that's what most people do. I, in my experience, most people just do extra credit projects to get out of the final anyway. But there will be a final if you want to take it, and I'll deliver it online like the quizzes. Um, more details about that coming later. Anyway, um, so as far as the schedule is concerned, we've only got about three or four classes left. So chapter 12, no quiz due next week. A couple of projects due. Chapter 13 on this day. Are there any questions about anything administrative? All right, well, let's charge into encryption. This encryption stuff, I'm now teaching a whole class in encryption, so I was motivated to update my stuff with more details, and I think it's more fun, too. So let's see how you like it. Uh, the main thing is now it's very easy to do all this stuff in Python, so I can demonstrate them all. And surprisingly enough to me, encryption is, seems to be the most rapidly changing part of this field. You would think the math would hold still, but it doesn't. It is. There are so many rapid changes that textbooks are often out of date. In my slides, a lot of them are out of date even after one semester. It's amazing how fast stuff changes here. So I rearranged the topics a little bit. They're still roughly following your textbook, but things have changed a lot since your textbook was last updated, which is going to be a year and a half ago. Anyway, so first, I'm just going to talk about the mathematical part of encryption. There are an enormous number of mathematical techniques in the world, like group theory, and field theory, and all sorts of crazy things. But we're engineers. We are not mathematicians. So we don't want to know all the esoteric math. We just want the math that has an immediate practical value to it. <laughs> and so on the internet, there are three kinds of math that matter to us. 
symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, and hash. That's all we need, and that's all we're going to cover here. Then next time, I'll talk about the implementation part, uh, public key infrastructure and the attacks. But just this today is the fundamental mathematical properties, which turns out to involve everything else, even up to politics and everything else. It's all tied together. Now, symmetric encryption is the simplest kind of encryption that has been around for thousands of years. Um, this goes, certainly goes back to the time of seizure and probably before that. This is where the whole point is to be able to maintain confidentiality. That was the only thing people cared about. You want to somehow send a secret to another person, like a military order. You want to write it down in some way that it can be transmitted through an untrustworthy channel, like a human running through territory that contains enemy spies. And if the spies get the message, they won't be able to read it because it's scrambled, and only the good guy at the other end will be able to read it. That's the idea. So Julius Caesar used the substitution cipher, where all you do, he of course used the Roman alphabet, not ours, but all you do is move every letter forward a couple places in the alphabet, like three. So A becomes D, and B becomes E, and so on. In an ancient period when almost no one could read at all, this was military-grade encryption. That was enough that nobody could get in without the magic key, which was, we, well, I, when I was a kid, they had the Captain Crunch decoder ring. You get in this box of cereal that did this had letters around a ring and it had another ring inside you could turn so you could do this, which does scramble things so you can't read them anymore. So uh, the simple seizure cipher is probably ROT13, which has the property of undoing itself. You move everything forward 13 letters, and if you move it forward another 13 letters, it undoes itself. And this is still used by Microsoft to protect your privacy in Windows, which is pretty bloody appalling. I mean, it was, it's been, broken for thousands of years. It's far more complicated than the crypto quips that the children solve on the Sunday newspaper to get the captions and cartoons. But this is how Microsoft protects your privacy with Internet Explorer shortcuts. So it's easy enough to do with Python. And I'm going to, there's no Python programming required in this course, but uh, you might want to learn Python. It's what most hackers use. It's very popular. And let me just uh, demonstrate some of this stuff. If I go to the right folder, which is where I keep my stuff for this class, 120. Three projects. All right, I've made a Caesar cipher program here. Let me just make this as big as I can. Uh, I should be able to make the window a little smaller. All right, so let's take, um, I'll just, first I'm just going to run it. Okay, if you want to run Python, you can just type Python and the name of a program, or you can even run it in immediate mode, which is what we're going to use after this. Let's clear get rid of this chunk. I get Python, Caesar. Okay, C A E. All right, I've already followed up. Did I spell Caesar wrong? C A E S A R. Hmm, my beautiful demo is already failing. Right, where did it go? I wrote a thing called Caesar.py earlier today, and there it is. And unfortunately, the Mac is reluctant to tell me where it is. Okay. It's in my root directory. Somehow I didn't put it in where I thought I put it. All right, so it's here. So Python, Caesar. All right, so I can put in a message like hello. And I can shift it by three, and it turns into K-H-O-R, so it's hard to read. And if I want to do ROT13, I can put in hello. And if I shift it by 13, it turns into U-R-Y-Y-B. And if I put that in here and shift it by another 13, it comes back to hello. So it's easy enough to do. The thing I wanted to point out to you is that this is not complicated at all. That's the whole program. So it takes about six or eight lines of code to do these simple things in Python. The ones you're doing later are even simpler. That's why I highly, if you don't know any programming at all, learn Python. It is so easy, you can just do it. You can do simple, coding with just a few commands and a few lines of code to solve simple problems like this. And uh, that's why most hackers love it. If you're not a very good coder, you don't make professional code, it's not the fastest, it's not the smallest, but you can solve problems and automate things instead of doing things by hand. Uh, one of my students from this program got an internship where he was getting vulnerability reports, the beginning guy to get, we get, every day there'd be a news report or a long list of new vulnerabilities, and he was typing them into something. And he did that for like six months, and then they promoted him to be in charge of interns, and they hired a couple more interns, and one of them actually knew some scripting and automated that job. 
but that was the big step forward. You know, if you know a little bit of coding, you become far more useful because you can figure out how to make simple things automatic. Anyway, so um, crypt, crypt analysis is the branch of mathematics where you find ways to break into encrypted routines. And this is now the procedure. You invent a new routine, and then crypt analysts will attack it to see if there is some easy way to break it. And if there is, then people shouldn't be using it. Or they decide they can't break in, and therefore it's strong enough to be of some value. Uh, the Germans used Enigma, which is just a mechanical system where you type these letters, and there were gears that would rotate and have settings on them, so the letter that came out was not equal to the letter you typed. And you would dial in a key, and they person at the other end would dial in the same key and they could type in the junk and it would decrypt it. And it was just a series of substitutions done with gears inside there and it was quite strong, strong enough for World War II. In fact, the way they cracked it, I think, was by stealing one. The steganography is another kind of cryptography where you conceal the actual existence of a message. And this gets you into side channels. The kind of cryptography you talked about first here is symmetric key cryptography, where you create a garbled message. So an attacker can tell that you did send a message. They just can't read it. In steganography, you want to send a message so the attacker cannot even tell that you sent a message. So you post a picture, and hidden in that picture is another picture. So this is what terrorists use, according to the Department of Defense. They have some system like go to Flickr and find the 10th picture of a house posted on Tuesday, and that picture has your instructions hidden in it. So most of the world does not know any message has been sent at all, but there is a hidden message somewhere. And of course, this is not that difficult technically. You can think of a lot of easy ways to do it. You could just say that the, your red, green, and blue value, the last bit of red is the message. So out of every <laughs> three bytes, I get one bit of message. So I can now hide anything in there. You could take the third bit and the tenth bit out of every fourth byte or something, just any pattern like that. Some of the bits in that thing implement something. And um, unless you use a standard algorithm, it's very hard to decrypt. Now, it's not that hard to detect. All people have to do is find the original image and notice that this image is somehow altered a little bit. And then they take the difference and then look for a pattern. But most people just use standard libraries and there are standard steganographic detecting tools that will see if you're using one of the standard steganography libraries. And of course, you can only hide a smaller thing and a bigger thing. So this is rich, full color image. This is a lower resolution black and white image. You can put text in there. You know, If you try to put one megabyte in something that's only two megabytes big, you're going to greatly distort it. All right, so an algorithm is the mathematical steps you go through to encrypt stuff. If you have a strong algorithm, then it scrambles things so effectively that there's no way to get the secrets out without the key. Now, the Caesar cipher is clearly not a strong algorithm because there are only 25 possible shifts. So you can quickly just try them all and get in without knowing the key. So that algorithm is weak, and the key is too small. You can try all options of the key to withstand any modern attack. All right, so uh, the key is one fundamental source of weakness. If your key is too short, your, no algorithm can save you because an attacker can just try all the keys. An 8-bit key has 256 values, 24-bit key has 2 to the 24 values, which is only 16 million. And as you know, computers can do billions of calculations per second, so trying all say, of 16 million is not that hard. 56 is the largest key that's been cracked by brute force you know, as of like 1997. Now I think they cracked a 64-bit key by brute force and never a 72-bit key. So this is the current limit. If you have only 56 bits in the key, that is too short. People can try all of them, but if you have 128 bits in the key, that is plenty. There is no computer or a group of computers anywhere on Earth that can try all of 2 to the 128 and their uh, keys, and there are pretty good arguments that there will never be a computer anywhere that can try that many keys. However, we'll talk about quantum computing. There are some dirty tricks that may crack into this stuff eventually. Um, so brute force, like say 1997 was the first time a 56-bit key was ever broken by brute force with a um, 14,000 machines over the internet, all cooperated for like three months, and they all combined to crack this key by brute force. This was extremely important at the time because the U.S. government was recommending a system using this key, and they were trying to prove it was not safe. 
So if you want to decide how many bits is enough, you could do estimate it various ways. If you have Pentium 4 is running uh, at one gigahertz for a year and 10 to the 10 computers, more than one for every person on Earth, that's a total of three times 10 to the 26 calculations of all the computers on Earth in a whole year. So uh, 128 bits is 10 to the 38, which is you know 10 to the 12, a million, million times more. So all the even a, you need a million planets with all the computers on Earth, and you need to wait for a million years to crack anything. So that would seem strong enough. That's one theory. Of course, the other problem is computers don't stay the same. Even this one gigahertz is out of date now. Now things are running four and five gigahertz and multiple cores. So the other thing is if Moore's law continues, if computers keep doubling in speed every two years, then by 2090, they will be doing this many calculations. And nobody knows how to predict the future. So and then another really tough thing is suppose you have something that's encrypted so nobody can get in. Is it okay if they can get in next year or in five years or in 10 years or 20 years? You might have something like an HIV test, which is really private and people probably really aren't happy if that comes out in 20 years. They might not even be happy if that comes out in 100 years. And so how do you encrypt anything and guarantee to people that it's safe for 50 or 100 years? This is very difficult. Anyway, if I was going to do that, I would probably not rely on the encryption. I would rely on having it locked in a room guarded by people who can upgrade the locks and stuff as time goes on. Um, I wouldn't trust any encrypted files to last for 30 or 50 years. But anyway, so here's how it works. You have clear text, you scramble it with the key, it turns into scrambled junk, you send it to let everybody see the scrambled junk. You don't care because only the person with the key can turn it back into plain text. That is what you want with symmetric encryption. And there are various algorithms that do this. This is what's commonly used and has been for millennia. Um, so you have one key and you have to share that key with the other person. So now you have this octomoron <coughs> called a shared secret. This is a fundamental problem with the system. You have a secret and then you tell somebody. How do you know that they don't tell somebody else? They don't let somebody make a copy of it. This is how mechanical keys work on the door. They give me a key. They don't know that I didn't make another key. Give it to someone else. As soon as you give a key to somebody else, you've lost control over how many people are really seeing that message. Fundamentally, that's the fundamental weakness in this system, and no mathematics can solve that problem in a world of symmetric encryption. So that's a disadvantage. The symmetric key has to remain secret, but it has to be distributed. So you've got a contradiction there. You have to, and that means you have to have some kind of trusted channel to deliver keys. And if you had a trusted channel, why don't you just send your message down the trusted channel? What's going on here? That's why the limitate that's a limitation of the system. And it does lead to, to crazy situations like in the British Navy in the Napoleonic Wars, they had the wooden ships, and there was a key, there was a a code book of the flag signals used to control the Navy. And the British naval captains were told, if you get caught by the French, that book has lead in the binding, it will sink. You have to throw that book over the side. And if you fail to throw that book over the side, and you get taken alive, the British Navy will pay a ransom to bring you back to London and then hang you. Because that book is worth more than your ship, more than your life, more than your whole crew. If you lose that book, you endanger our whole operation because they can't update the keys because the ships sail for like years. So that's the problem with this shared secret stuff. It creates this very big problem of key distribution and key handling. Anyway, some symmetric algorithms encrypt things one bit at a time and just a long stream of bits. Block ciphers are more common. They take a block of data, typically eight bytes or 16 bytes, and encrypt that all at once. So DECSS was one of the early ones. CSS was the content scrambling system that was used to encrypt movies. So that you could only play them in an approved player, and if you copied them and tried to play them somewhere else, it wouldn't work. That was the idea. So they cracked it by brute force because it had a 40-bit key, and there aren't that many combinations of 40 bits, so they just tried them all, um, and this led to entertaining the fact that there was a secret 40-bit number that you weren't supposed to know, and people had various ways to put it on T-shirts, and uh, otherwise sort of thumb your nose at the fact that it was technically illegal to know this number. Um, the data encryption standard was approved in, uh, by the US government and specified as the way to encrypt secret data in America. It would, IBM, uh, the way this always happens, National Institute of Standards has a contest 
They invite proposals, mathematicians and companies send in proposed systems, and then for about five years, all the mathematicians attack these systems and write papers and analyze to see if they can break in. And then they have finalists that make it, uh, a bunch of them get hacked into and then they're gone. A few of them make it to the final stages, which means they're all pretty secure. And then they pick one of them and give them the blessing and call them the official government standard. So that was DES, the official government standard. It started out as a system that IBM wrote called Lucifer. And when IBM wrote it, it had 128 bits. But when the National Institute of Standards approved it, they strangely shrunk it down to 64 bits, and they took eight bits of that and used it for something else. So there were really only 56 bits in the key for no apparent reason. The computers could certainly have calculated the 128-bit version. It's not that it was impossible. For some, for no explained reason, they shortened it to 56 bits. In retrospect, almost everyone believes that this was so they could read all the encrypted stuff because they had uh, computers that were 20 years ahead. This is generally the general belief of people in the cryptography and security community, which has not been proven, is that the NSA has secret stuff that is 20 years ahead of the rest of us. Several times that has been proven to be the case. They have superior analytical methods and superior computing methods which are top secret and kept from us, and they're ahead, and their mission is to read everybody's secret transmissions so they don't want us using something they can't read. And their goal is this thing they call NOBUS. We'll talk about it more. They want to have some way where they can read it, but nobody else. So anyway, people were pretty suspicious about this 56-bit key stuff, and in 1988, the NSA began to think that people outside the NSA might be able to crack it, in 1997, it was cracked in three months. And in 1998, the EFF in San Francisco built a special computer just for this purpose called Deep Crack. They had a special chip written just to do this, and they made a board full of hundreds of just this chip, and that thing could do all two to the 56 keys in three days of computation. So they could totally break it without having the key, and that was the end of this system. You could not in any way justify continuing to use a system that was as dangerous at that point. So you can play with it here. Uh, it's easy enough to use. DES is still around. You can put it in Python. All you do is run Python in interactive mode. And from crypto.cipher with a capital C, import DES. All right. Now, the way DES works, I create a new object. Let me just get my things down here so I can see the commands. All right, so you have to have a key, and the key has to be eight bytes. It doesn't really use all eight bytes. So I can put secret and two exclamation points. That's eight bytes. It's really only going to use 56 bits of those eight bytes. And then I can create a cipher object, which is new, and it's based on that key. And now I can encrypt things. What did I do? Uh, C, oh, Cypher is DES. Okay, I'm mixing what kind of links to Cypher is DES new. Okay, all right. Now C is going to be Cypher.encrypt. I can now encrypt a message. CNIT 123, period. That's eight bytes, which is what you use here. Um, and I didn't, did I not count to eight correctly? Thought I did. Run fast. That's nine. That's nine? Yep. What was the space? Oh, I get rid of the period. All right, thank you. Good, good. I appreciate it. All right, so now I've encrypted that. Now I can print the encrypted stuff. C, if I just print C, it's going to be unprintable junk because it's not ASCII. I, the easy way to print it is to encode it as hex. So that's what it looks like in hex. Each two characters here is a byte. You've been through that in the binary games and stuff. So that's the encoded version of CNET 123. Not very readable. You send something like that, nobody can read it. The only person that can read it is somebody that has the key, and they can do it with uh, cipher decrypt. So cipher decrypt, and I can decrypt C. And that gets me back to my original text. So somebody who knows the algorithm and they have possession of this key can read it, but people who don't have it can't read the key unless there's a defect in the system. And the defect here is that that key is way too short. And ever since 1997, people with a few thousand dollars 
of it, money to invest can easily try all possible keys and get in without knowledge of the keys. So this is no longer considered safe. It's a little bit better than plain text, but it's like WEP. It's an encryption scheme that does not really protect your data very well. So we had to improve it. The simplest fix was triple desk, where you just do three rounds of encryption with, with DDS. And this, you can use the same key twice with encrypt, and encrypt with another key, and then decrypt with the first key, or you can use three different keys. And the end result is it's as good as having twice as long a key because of a thing called the meet in the middle attack that we go through in the other class. But anyway, the point is this triple desk is perfectly fine. That gets you up to an effective key length of 112 bits. And as we said, anything above about 80 bits is effectively uncrackable right now. So triple desk is fine. And triple desk also, if you build hardware that does triple desk, it's very easy to lower its security to single desk if you want by just setting all three keys to the same. That's why it typically does encrypt, decrypt, encrypt. So you use the same key three times, you get back to the original. And this is important in practice because people might have established infrastructure that uses the older system. And they might want to upgrade gradually. So they buy some new devices, and for a period of time, they run the new devices in the legacy mode where they speak the old protocol. And then at some later time, they'll finally replace all the old devices and upgrade to the new system. And this is how Microsoft domain controllers work. If you have a Windows NT4 domain, and then you buy a Windows Server 2012 or 2016 domain controller, you can choose to run it in legacy mode so it will speak the old insecure protocols and interrupt with your old hardware. Or you can choose to run it in native mode where it will speak the latest version of everything and be very secure, but then you have to replace all your older stuff up to that standard. So those are the two business decisions people make all the time. Anyway, so that's fine, triple desk, is secure enough, but it's not the most efficient way to encrypt stuff anymore because this system came out in 2002. They had another contest saying, okay, we can't get away with tricking people and forcing them to use this unsafe desk anymore. So we want to have a new system. So they had another contest and in 2002 there was a winner and it was declared to be the AES. This was from Ringe Jail, was the original algorithm. And this has keys that are 128, 192 or 256 bits long. And this is currently considered unbreakable and it is approved even for military secrets in the AES-256 version. So this is actually very easy. You can do it with the same kind of way in Python. Um, you can import AES from the same source. Now you can make a new cipher object of type AES, but first you have to have a key. So let me first set my key. The key now has to be 16 bytes long. So when I did it before, this worked. All right, and now I can make cipher equals AES new based on that key. And I somehow followed it up again. All right, 16 bytes long. What is length of key? 15, all right, I need three dots, fine. Okay, there. Now it's 16 bytes long. Now I can use that to make an AES object. Okay, now I can set C equals cipher, encrypt. Now I, the message also has to be that long. So I have spelled this out. Pigeons plotting is 16 bytes. And it would have complained if it wasn't. So now I can print that. Once again, it turns the ASCII into unprintable binary. So if you want to see what's there, it's best to encode it in hex. Yeah. All right. So this plain text message turns into that mess of hexadecimal, and that's the point. Nobody can read that without knowing the key. They have to know the algorithm and the key. And this is now the standard. And if you want to decrypt it, you can just do cipher decrypt because this cipher object includes that key. So I can take the encrypted stuff, which is C, and put it in here and decrypt it. And it turns into, uh, I encrypted it instead of decrypting it. Pardon me. Decrypt. There. Now it turns back into readable text. So this is. That's the system. This is the stuff you send over an untrusted medium, and you can have enormous confidence that nobody's getting in there without the key. So as long as you have somehow overcome that difficult key distribution problem and made sure that only authorized people have the key, you now have got confidentiality. 
Nobody can read that stuff except authorized people. All right. Idea algorithm is one of the finalists in the AES contest that was not chosen by the government and given the stamp of approval to be AES. All the finalists are considered quite secure. They all survived serious attack by the best mathematicians in the world. Just one of them was chosen by the government and approved. And so this means this is free for non-commercial use and you can write code using it. Most people prefer to use the government standard. But if you don't want to use the government standard, there are other ones out there. And there are some people who have such serious political worries about the government that they would rather use something that is not approved by the government because the National Institute of Standards has been caught many times putting a secret factor in the encryption routines. And many people think just the fact that they approve it means you probably can't trust it. It probably means that you shouldn't be trusting it if your adversary model includes the U.S. government. If you're cooperating with the government and doing business with the government, then you want to just use the government standard and you're not afraid of the government seeing your stuff. But if you're an enemy country or a terrorist or a political protest organization that is trying to hide things from the government, then it might be good not to use the official stuff. And here's some alternatives. Blowfish was written by Bruce Schneier, a very famous cryptographer. He wrote one that did not win the finalist, but it made it to the, it did not win to become AES, but it did make it to the finals. So it is certainly quite secure, and it's another option you can use. Um, RC4 is a stream cipher that encrypts bits one at a time. It's in, built into a lot of crypto systems. RC4 has a serious mathematical problem that is causing people to really get fed up with it. It is not white, which means that if you take data and feed it into RC4, it does not have an equal chance of producing every possible byte of output. It has a slight chance of producing 127 more often than other bytes. And that means you can, if you can encrypt billions of bytes through RC4, you can deduce something about the key from the statistical properties of what comes out. And there are a whole series of attacks based on this that involve running millions or billions of bytes through the system and doing an analysis, you can determine something about the key, which is kind of like what happened to WEP, which in fact used RC4, although it was not this exact problem that caused it to fail, you'd have to encrypt thousands or millions of, of, mess, of packets, and then look at the pattern in that, and you can deduce some information about the key, making a brute force attack fast. So now people can decrypt these things in an hour or 75 hours, depending on which system you're using, because RC4 does not really conceal all the information about the key that it should be concealing. RC5 is another one intending to be better, and I think there's nothing particularly wrong with RC5, but it's a block cipher, it's not a stream cipher. Um, uh, it's, you know, one good thing about RC5 is it lets you have many different key lengths. So it's a good way to test just the effective key length. So people put up challenges and they offer you like a prize of 10,000 bucks if you decrypt it, and people do it. So 56 and 64 bit RC5 has been cracked, but 72 bit RC5 has never been cracked. There is a, there are computers working on it, but if the computers don't get more powerful, it'll take a thousand years to break at the current rate. Therefore, you might say it is stupid to even try, but of course, the computers will get more powerful, so it's not really going to be a thousand years. If Moore's Law continues, a thousand years will really only take about 15 years before computers are a thousand times more powerful. So, we'll see. But this is where I get this statement that in practice, the evidence is pretty good that if you have 80 bits, that's enough. Nobody can even crack a 72-bit one yet. But... Um, for top secret military, they recommend AES-256 to give you some breathing room. All right, I got some cahoots about that stuff. Let me bring them up. My cahoots are here. And there it is. You have to have the glorious cahoot music. Are you getting your money back? There we go. Oh yeah, we got 11 people online and four here, so there should be a few people.
seconds. I have time to write down stuff on this paper. 11, 22, 17, the hoops. All right. I'll wait another five seconds. All right. Apparently, that's all the cahooters there are. Five questions. So which system is unsafe on this list? Yeah. All right, you guess? Unsafe since the late 90s. Probably unsafe before that, but anyway, now you can't trust it. Which one uses wind jail? I think that is the name of the person in bed. Two people. Two people. Two people. Are the names being defined? Yeah, that's, I know where I say is too. Yeah. Could be either way. Have to Google it to find out. All right, that's AES. Wind jail is what well, a version of wind jail was used and turned into AES. He had more options in the original, but AES codified just three of them. Which system was never approved by NIST, but still considered drunk? So if you greatly dislike your government, this might be the one to use. Oh, and that's an idea. Good. All right. How long should a symmetric encryption key be? Oh. Uh, 64 is absolutely not enough. 56 has been cracked and 64 has been cracked by brute force. 128 is enough as far as anybody knows. 1024 is vast overkill. Um, anything above about 80 is probably good. But 64 is absolutely not enough. All right. So, what security goal cannot be provided by symmetric encryption? Good. All right. You cannot get non repudiation. Non-repudiation means you cannot deny what you did later. But if you do something and you have symmetric encryption, there are at least two people that have the key, so you really don't know which one of them made a message. So non-repudiation is something you can never get with this system, and that means you cannot have financial transactions that involve loaning money with symmetric encryption, because you can't sign something and then have someone come to you later and say, you must pay because you signed. They'll say, oh, no, the bank had the key. They forged it. So it's fundamentally failed. So I have E, which is Eric, I think, and Tammy, and Des Ka. That's uh, Ka is your real name, I think. Yep. And Tammy, I'm not so sure. Let's see. I got a message. You're Tammy. Good. Good. Really, Tammy? Okay. Good. That's a good sign. And Dave, oh, David Des Ka. Oh, Des Ka is not who I thought it was. Okay. There was a guy named Ka, but that's not who it is. Okay. All right, I got your name, and a Tammy, and E is Eric. Okay, so I identified these people. Good. Now let's get on to the next system for a little while, because I broke these up into different smaller chunks this time. So asymmetric encryption is the second thing. This is new. This came out in the late 1970s, and it was a revolutionary improvement. Suppose you want to log into Google. You're going to type in a password, and you want to send it to Google over the Internet, which anybody can pick it up. And you don't have any way to put a secret key there first. You have to somehow send a secret to an untrusted channel without any previous data going through. That's what this does. It's a miracle. You can send secrets through untrusted channels. So you have two keys. You have to make a public and private key pair to receive data. Then you publish the public key. And anybody can encrypt data with the public key and send it to you. But you're the only one that can read it with your private key. That's how it works. This actually is something we are doing, we're accustomed to all the time. This is how mailboxes work. You have this big door on the top where anybody can put mail in, 
but nobody can take it out except the post office person has the key to open the bottom door. That's how this works. You have open the public key is the big door here. Anybody can use the public key to put things in, but nobody can get it out except the holder of the private key. And the cool thing is you never give anybody the private key. There's no distribution problem. You keep it secret. Now this makes sense, and this is a system that can be relied upon, where you have a secret and you never tell anybody. That's a whole lot more logical than having a secret and sharing it with somebody. The only problem is you cannot send anything with your key pair. You can only receive with your key pair. The person who is intending to receive secrets must first prepare for it by generating a key pair. So if generating a key pair is complicated, you can't talk to people who can't figure out how to do it. That's a problem in the system. It is much more computationally intensive and much more complicated to set up. But the end result is you can send secrets to an untrusted medium. So now, if I want to send these lottery numbers to somebody, I encrypt them and make this scrambled stuff and send them through any untrustworthy medium. But the only person who can read them is the person that has that private key. And they should never have shared that with anybody. So there really should be a high degree of confidence that they're the only person having the key. Without me having to have any kind of mysterious way of transmitting keys beforehand. So that's the game. This provides authenticity and non repudiation now I know who sent a message if they sign it with their private key, and they cannot lie about it later because there's only one person that has that private key. So I know who is signing things when I use this system to sign messages. So these algorithms are more scalable. If I wanted to have symmetric encryption secrets with everybody in this room, I'd have to have a key I share with you, and a key I share with you, and a key I share with you, and you two would have to have a key. So if you have N people, you have something like N squared keys, which is crazy. If they went to the internet, we'd have to have each have a separate key for everybody on the internet. That's impossible. But with public key encryption, everybody just needs one private key and one public key. And the whole world can use the same public key to send me secrets. With complete security, I'm the only one who can read them. I don't need a different public key for every person. So it scales. This is why it's really a hit. And so the particular version of this, this is a general idea, and there are various different ways to do it mathematically. The one that became a hit was the first one, RSA, named after these three mathematicians, Gravest, Shamir, and Edelman. And they did, this is what made SSL, the secure sockets layer, which is what encrypts most of the data on the internet. It's done with um, the private key is a prime number, and you multiply two prime numbers together to make the public key. And it has been a known hard problem from the days of Pythagoras, thousands of years ago, that you can't factor large numbers into their component primes in any rapid way. It takes a long time, and if they are really long, like 200 digits, it takes a really long time to where you really can't do it in practice, and that's how this system works. So you can do this. Let's give it a shot in Python. It's, like I say, Python, this is why Python is fantastic, and why hackers love it. You can do almost anything with just a few lines of code. So I can go to the same library, and I can import, there, import RSA. Now, uh, oh, crypto public key, pardon me, not the same library. Public key. All right, now I have to generate a key pair to do it. So they have an algorithm to do that. Key equals, instead of typing in a key like I did before, I have to generate a key, which is actually not a simple thing to do. So let's go for a shorter key like 512, which is not too secure, but it's easier, faster to generate. Nope, got to have 1024. It's the smallest one to let me use. All right. Notice that took about a second. In fact, let me just show you something fun about this. This system is so complicated, even computers have trouble with it. If I do a 2048-bit key, it took about two seconds. Now, there are people talking about how we should use longer keys. Two, three, four, five, Six, took six seconds to do that. When I went up to like 8192 and 17,000, it took like minutes, like five minutes to generate the key. It's really doing a lot of work to make that key. Anyway, let's go on with 4096. Now I've got my plain text, which can be any links now, like encrypt this secret message for CNET 123. So there's my message. And so to encrypt it, I make ciphertext, which is public. Oh, I've got to make the key, public key. 
I'm just going to call it PK equals key dot public key. All right. And then ciphertext equals PK dot encrypt of the plain text message. And then there's a couple parameters which can just be zero. All right. There, now I've created this stuff called ciphertext. If I print the ciphertext, again, it's unprintable garbage, unreadable garbage. So I better just encode it with hex to see how it looks. And it's encrypted stuff, but it is really big. So unlike the other encryption routines, you get this giant blob of junk that is always as long as your key. So, uh, but as you might imagine, nobody can get from that back to the plain text without the key. It's really pretty complicated. It takes a lot more computing power. The messages you send are a lot bigger. It takes more bandwidth. It uses your more battery power and all that. But it has the miraculous property that you can send a secret without previously preparing the pump by transmitting a secret key. And of course, you can decrypt it. I can just do key.decrypt of that thing, which I guess I called ciphertext. I think I gotta do KP, let's see. Oh, it worked, okay, that decrypted it. So you, if you have the key, you can decrypt it. At the, and, it and encrypt it, but it takes a lot of CPU, and that's that public key encryption. Diffie Hellman, this is something, uh, rumors say the NSA had this for 20 years, it was a military secret, we didn't have it. We, but Field Diffie here and Hellman reinvented it on the outside world and published it. Mathematicians will eventually figure it out outside the security community. He reached the essential trick here, which is how to exchange, to uh, negotiate a key without sending the key over the line. Uh, what happens is you each start with a prime number, then you multiply it by another number, then you send some numbers over the, over the wire that are formed by the multiplication of those numbers, and they allow you to agree on a key without ever sending the key directly. That's how RSA works. That's how Diffie-Hellman works. The Diffie-Hellman algorithm simply delivered a key. It did not encrypt anything, but it showed how to distribute a key over an untrusted channel. And because of that, you could then use various algorithms to do it. Uh, the most popular algorithm is the RSA algorithm to encrypt, which uses Diffie-Hellman to exchange the keys and then encrypts using the prime numbers. Elliptic curves is one that came out later and is actually more efficient. The keys are shorter, the math is more complicated, but the CPU time is much less. It can be 20 times faster to compute. So it's very good for things like cell phones and mobile devices. And the NSA pushed it very much saying everybody should switch to this. Um, Suspiciously, elliptic curve cryptography cannot, it's not easy to generate the elliptic curves. So in fact, the NSA told people what exact curve to use. And then they told people you should all switch to this algorithm, which made a lot of people suspicious that they had backdoored it. And there is some evidence that they did indeed backdoor some versions of it. But it was, LGML is another option out there that uses what's called the discrete logarithm problem. It's actually quite close to just using uh, Diffie Hellman uh, exchange and, and encrypting in the simplest way. We do all these things in detail in the crypto class. Um, like I say, the NSA was busted again for backdooring the crypto. Uh, Microsoft researchers are actually the ones that found that there was something suspicious about one version of ECC. And then it turned out that the NSA had not only put what appeared to be a backdoor in the code, but they had also paid a million dollars to RSA to bribe them into making this the default encryption routine of some of their software to make sure people used it more. And so that all made a pretty big scandal. And I just want to point out the military term for this is no bus, which means nobody but us. The goal of the military is to make people use a system that they can hack into, but nobody else can hack into. That is their goal. They want to put some kind of secret backdoor in it so they can get in, but it has to be somehow arranged so nobody else can get in. And what Bruce Schneier said, and what they did with the ECC is they poisoned the random number generator. If you poison a random number generator so the numbers are not really random, that is very hard for anyone to detect. And um, that's what has happened a few times by 
mistakes and also by the NSA poisoning things as far as we can tell. The NSA has never admitted backdooring anything, but the external researchers have come up with very damning, very convincing evidence that they have done it several times. And that's why a lot of people are very worried and Silent Circle is one of the uh, privacy organizations that wants to have privacy for journalists and whistleblowers and stuff. And so their threat model does include the U.S. government. And so they refuse to use anything the NIST has approved, like I'm saying, because they are afraid that anything they approve has been backdoored. Nobody's ever proven that there's a backdoor in AES, but nobody has proven there isn't one either. You just don't know. Anyway. Uh, so the NS then the NSA, after years of telling people to go to quantum computing, which would be faster and cheaper, they reversed course completely in 2016. They sent out a memo saying, forget everything we've said because quantum computers are coming. Quantum computers are completely different than the digital computers we're using today. Digital computers we're using today actually waste a lot of the power of the hardware. You have hundreds of billions of electrons in your circuit you combine them and you make one high voltage for like a microsecond and you call that a one. That one bit consists of like a billion billion electrons and you combine them all together and call it one bit. In quantum computing, you use the quantum mechanical properties of the electrons themselves. So each electron is a qubit and each part of it does computing. It's like every atom in the computer is an individual processor. So the end result is, if you want to crack something like a 128-bit key, you only need to do two to the 64 operations to crack it, because the actual quantum mechanical properties of the fundamental particles do have to work. So that will change the whole game, and in particular, the current theoretical prediction is that when quantum computers actually work, all these public key systems will be shot. Even if you make the key a million bits long, it won't be strong enough. The private key stuff will work as long as you double the size of the keys. They say AES-128 might fall, but AES-256 will still be fine. So here's what they said. In, they mean quit using all these things you're using now. Quit using AES-128, SHA-256, RSA with 2048 bit keys, uh, elliptic curves with 256 bit keys. All these things they say are no longer trustworthy because within the next one or two decades, quantum computers will come and they will crack these. It is interesting that the NSA suddenly put this out. Um, now, if you read the computing news, every week or two, there's another breakthrough in quantum computers. Uh, my personal opinion, which I cannot prove, is that the NSA is always 20 years ahead of us, and the reason they gave us this warning is because they have a quantum computer. That would follow the general trend of them being 20 years ahead. They probably can already crack all these with their quantum computer, and that's why they're telling us we better knock it off, because they figure our enemies will pretty soon have one too. Anyway, so um, all these public key algorithms are vulnerable, and uh, the private key systems with keys twice as long are expected to be okay even in the world of quantum computers, but public key algorithms are gonna have to invent a new category of public key algorithms to survive quantum computers, and there is now another contest going on from the National Institute of Standards where mathematicians are proposing new quantum-resistant algorithms, and after a few years, they will choose one of them and call it the new cryptographic standard. But right now, nobody is quite sure how to do that. That will be resolved in the next few years. So now what they recommend is keep using the existing standards to make the keys much bigger. And that should get you through the next couple of decades before we have new algorithms to replace these. So 3072 bits is what's now recommended for RSA. And here, so there's a lot of these things. Uh, it turns out that a lot of people don't generate their own prime numbers like they should. They keep reusing other primes. And that means, um, that's why the NSA has an incredible data center in Utah. The NSA or DHS, I'm not sure which one, but they're recording all the internet traffic for years because when they do manage to find these prime numbers by hunting, they'll be able to reverse you to decrypt all this traffic that was encrypted with related keys. So that's called forward secrecy. TLS 1.2, which almost every website has gone to, has perfect forward secrecy, which means it uses a different key for every message. All other versions of encryption protocols used on the internet of HTTPS did not have this property. So if you have encrypted <coughs> communication and someone manages to steal the key later, they can go back and decrypt a whole bunch of messages. So uh, that's a step. Anyway, then there's digital signatures. I mentioned before, here's how a digital signature works. You have something like a loan agreement. I'm gonna 
buy a car, I'm borrowing money for it, I have to pay 500 bucks a month, and if I ever quit paying, you can impound the car. That's what this agreement says, that agreement is not a secret, but you have to sign it. So you take a hash of it, which is just like a fingerprint, and then you encrypt the hash with your private key, and you attach it to the document. This is also not a secret. So you have this document, and then you have this signature, which is unreadable junk. Anybody that wants to verify that you signed it can decrypt this with your public key, which is not a secret, and then they can hash this and compare it. And if these two values match, that means two things. It means that you signed it because nobody else has that private key, and it means nobody altered it because this matches. So you signed it, and this is the unaltered thing you signed. This now has the legal force of a signature on paper. You can now borrow money and do financial transactions with this, and it was codified in law in the Digital Money and Copyright Act of 1998 under um, Clinton, Bill Clinton, to make commerce possible on the internet. So you do not have to have a piece of paper signed with a pen to make agreements, which was necessary until that time to have a legally binding agreement. So this was the digital signature standard, and it is now considered uh, as good as a signature of paper. You have to use the SHA algorithm to do the hashing, and you have to use RSA to do the encryption because that's all there was at this time. That became the thing that was codified in the standard. Bill Zimmerman, at this time in the 90s, decided to make a public key encryption email that everybody could use. By the way, I tried earlier in the 90s and 80s, but I couldn't do it. When I saved myself a world of grief. I was using 8-bit processors, and I couldn't make it work, which is a good thing because this guy had to spend about 10 years um, fighting going to prison for because the U.S. government regarded this encryption routine as being like a military secret because our enemies could use it to encrypt stuff that the government couldn't open and they tried to prosecute him because he put it on the web and let everybody download it. And I certainly would have done the same thing except I wasn't a good enough coder to write it. Anyway, um, I was trying and I failed. He made it. And he ended up having about 10 years of struggle with the government until they finally knocked it off because, you know, there are mathematicians in China and Russia and North Korea, too, and you can't hide math from them, but our government thought we could for a while. I think we're coming right up on another batch of cahoots. Yeah, all right, we'll get up to there and then take a break. So he made this thing called Pretty Good Privacy, which is his system. That's a proprietary system he sells, and there's an open-source version called GPG, GNU Privacy Guard, that does the same thing, but it's open-source and free. It is very secure, it is so secure Snowden wanted to use it to encrypt the stuff he was leaking. The problem is it is very, very hard to use. So hard to use that most of the people that developed it have admitted that they don't use it. You have these irritating long private keys and you have to not lose them and pretty soon you aren't using the same computer and you didn't carry it around and it just makes you crazy. You never seem to have the key you need when you need it. It's very strong mathematically, but the key handling is so cumbersome that in practice it's almost useless. Anyway, pretty good privacy supports all these uh, cryptographic algorithms. And uh, for internet attachments, there's S-MIME, which is used to encrypt and sign email messages and attachments. And there's another one called Privacy Enhanced Mail, which is not used that commonly, but it did become the standard for expressing public key signatures. You can, public keys can be printed in this PEM format. Uh, and so I got a few cahoots about this stuff which is the second batch of cahoots here. Good, I hear the sounds indicating that the cahoot music will appear. Okay, there we are. They win, I'll have to find out who they are. What's that? It's getting longer lately, which means I think they're becoming more popular. Yeah. NSA. <laughs> yeah. Justice League. Okay. I think 10 or 11 is what we had before. I mean, I'll wait another five seconds. Is somebody still come? Irish, okay, good. Right? One, two, government global here. That's good. Oh, there you go. All right. I guess that's it. Okay, five questions. 
Alice sends a message to Bob with public key encryption. What key does she use to encrypt it? Okay, we use Bob's public key, not a popular answer at all. I always ask this question, and the first time I always get this. Remember, the point about public key encryption is it lets you receive secrets. You can't send secrets. Alice's keys are useless to send anything. Bob has to make a public-private key pair, and people can send things to him with his public key that he can open. That's why it's a little backwards. Public key encryption does not let you send secrets. It lets you receive secrets. All right. So, Alice sends a message to Bob using public key encryption. What key does Bob use to read it? Barry uses his private key to read it, and it doesn't matter who it comes from. Everybody in the world uses his public key to send him stuff, and he reads it with his private key. All right, so which system performs key exchange but not encryption? Okay, that's Tippy Hellman. That was basically what uh, blew the lid off this and made a top secret military thing available to us in the private sector. All right, which system is the most efficient, uses the least CPU and RAM? All right, that's easy to see. Those elliptic curves are a little bit baffling, but the keys are much shorter, so the computation is much faster. All right. What's the NSA's goal? The backdoors and encryption. That's what they want. They want to have a system that nobody else can use, but they can use. There are people trying to say this is impossible, they should stop backdooring their encryption, but the law enforcement and espionage community are not on board with that. They are continuing to seek this goal. All right, so, aha, uh -huh. so Daniel, I know, uh, government, that's you, okay, I'll get your name later, and gobble, gobble, is gobble, gobble in the room? Gobble, gobble, will have to send me a text here, it looks like it's coming. So we'll pick up at 7.20, take a 10 minute break. I will take a look and see if I know who gobble, gobble is. Aha, uh -huh. gobble, gobble, okay, good. Thank you, I have the secret identity of gobble, gobble. All right, I'm gonna um, stop this share, so break the video in two. I'll start another one in 10 minutes.